It's Thursday the 18th of November um, and the time is 4pm uh, UK time so it's time to say welcome to today's Marine Biology Live. Marine Biology Live is a series of monthly presentations and conversations where we invite members of the marine biological community in its widest sense to share the work that they're doing to explore, understand and sustainably interact with the ocean and its inhabitants. Before we start the session, remember that those of you who are joining us in Zoom can use the Q&A function um, to ask and upvote questions at the end of the, the performance. Um, and you can share, share, before, uh, share comments then too. If you'd like to ask a question at the end, um, you can click your raise hand icon and we should be able to activate your microphone. Please remember all of the interactions today are gonna to be live streamed and recorded to share publicly. Um, so finally, um, and finally, if you're not already a member of the Marine Biological Association, Association please consider joining and to support our work and become part of the marine biological community. You can find it more on our website. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, I'm Jack Sewell. Um, for today's session, it's my absolute pleasure to be able to welcome Miranda Lowe, Principal Curate, Crustacean Curator at the Natural History Museum, London. Um, science historian, Catherine Booth, and the wonderful electric voice theatre singers, British Sign Language, that's a British Sign Language interpreter Lauren Lister, as well, and the voices for the future virtual choir, who are led by Francis M. Lynch. For the next forty-five minutes, the team are going to guide us through a musical celebration of crustacean biologist Isabella Gordon and all of her work. of the scientist's clan called Isabella Gordon, who lived between 1901 and 1988. She had a remarkable story showing a determined character alongside scientific ability and succeeded in her career through perseverance and hard work. Isabella Gordon's life began in very humble and impoverished surroundings Yet, she became the first female scientist to be appointed to a permanent post at the British Museum Natural History, now the Natural History Museum, and stayed in post for 38 years. The current scientist in Isabella's post is here with us today and has also given many years to the job, Miranda Lowe. As a child, I loved wildlife, animals, nature, and photography. So family trips to the countryside and museums spurred my interest to pursue a career in science. After leaving university, I ventured into the world of full-time employment, briefly working in a local hospital's medical school, doing research into rheumatoid arthritis. Then I moved on to working on a short-term contract for the government department, known at the time as the Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery and Food, as a junior researcher. Once that contract was up, I needed to find more permanent employment. 
And at that time, my regular reading material was the New Scientist magazine, where in the job section, there was an advert for an assistant scientific officer in marine invertebrates. I started out my career at the museum as an assistant scientific officer, much like Isabella, which is the equivalent to a curatorial assistant today. Now, some 30 years later, as a principal curator and museum scientist, I still enjoy the investigative approach of marine biology, natural history, and the challenges that collections management and research science bring in caring for a plethora of historically important marine invertebrate specimens, which include Charles Darwin's barnacles and corals. I, Miranda Lowe, was born in Balham, borough of Wandsworth, South London. Isabella Gordon was born in Keith, Banffshire, in northeast Scotland. Her parents were unmarried, not readily accepted in a rural community, and very likely to have led to discrimination. The family also had a very low income. Her father was a labourer, and her mother had been in domestic service before Isabella's birth. At that time, free school education ended at the age of 14, and children like Isabella would usually have been expected to leave school and get a job to help supplement the family income. However, she was obviously a clever child and in order to complete her school education, she was awarded a small bursary of eight pounds a year for three years. This enabled her to pass her final exams and qualify for university. University education for someone with little money was also difficult, but Isabella managed to support herself at Aberdeen University by earning a little extra working as a student demonstrator, and she succeeded in gaining a BSc degree in 1922. After originally wanting to pursue a career in pharmacy, due to my love of chemistry at secondary school, I decided to switch to a more biological science route at university. Graduating from a background in molecular research with a degree in applied biology, and, and, once, and once, joined, once I joined the museum for the first few years, I had an in-house curatorial training of how to preserve the specimens the specimen collections. And for the first eight years, I had taxonomic training in crustacea, in particular on amphipods, shrimp-like animals, with Joan Ellis, my line manager at the time, and Dr. Roger Lincoln as the in-house natural history museum specialist. Using a microscope and the museum collections nearly every day was an important factor to me in the early days of my career development. I have subsequently gone on to do further training, have an MSc in collection management and biological recording and other academic studies while working full time. Ultimately, I have gone on to teach others and students that visit and research the collections. A common career in Isabella's day was teaching. This is for science female graduates. And indeed, Isabella took a teacher training course and qualified as a science teacher. However, in 1923, her ability was recognized and she was awarded a research scholarship at Aberdeen University, which led to her first publications. This gave her confidence to apply for a postgraduate research scholarship at Imperial College, and her study resulted in the award of a PhD in 1926. A fellowship award then took her to the USA for about 18 months, after which she returned to London and took up a post at the British Museum Natural History, now the Natural History Museum, as an assistant keeper of crustacea 
the first female scientist on the permanent staff there. Her financial situation would still have been quite precarious and finding affordable accommodation in London close to the museum would not have been easy. Eventually, Isabella was helped to find a flat by an organisation which still exists, Women's Pioneer Housing. This had been founded by suffragists in 1920 with the aim of providing single women with suitable homes. Isabella and two of her fellow female colleagues at the Natural History Museum all were be able to benefit from this scheme. I was very young when I joined the museum and remarkably possibly the first black female scientist on the permanent staff within the Marine Invertebrate Invertebrates Division. As a woman in science, I've heard that Isabella faced tough issues in a male dominated hierarchical scientific sector and some elements of that still exist today. But the sector has various equality, diversity and inclusion networks striving to make the workplace and academia better, more inclusive and representative. Despite some of my personal challenges in the world of scientific work over the years, I'm enthusiastic about advocating for the use and scientific application of museum collections, looking at the impacts of science in society, where in turn helping people to understand why I do what I do in my job. Communicating my science is vital to inspire young minds especially girls, essentially to become the scientists, taxon taxonomists and curators of the future. It is extremely important to have representation of women and diversity at all levels of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, as this provides a well-balanced, informed set of opinions and views within an organisation thus providing a sector for many to feel comfortable in, supporting opportunities to be creative and encouraging more innovative thoughts resulting in a more resilient and productive workforce within STEM. I was proud to walk through the doors of the Natural History Museum on my first day, as I'm sure Isabella would have been. with light springing footsteps they trample her past. Tis the march of the women of science. Tis the march, tis the march, tis the march of the women of Isabella's earliest scientific publications were published between 1926 and 1929 in the Philosophical Transa Transactions of the Royal Society and involved studies of the development of the skeleton of sea urchins and starfish. On her PhD from the University of London, and her DSc, her Doctor of Science, from the University of Aberdeen, resulted from this, this work. For the first, she acknowledges the Marine Laboratory at Plymouth for providing her with original specimens. But her study for the third of these papers was undertaken at Woods Hole in the USA while on her Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. It seems she did visit the laboratory of Plymouth Marine Biological Association at least once, and she certainly corresponded with them. Um, this is a notebook from 
1947 to 48, where she mentions her visit to Plymouth. Um, in the, the small piece which had been enlarged there, it says, these lived very well in tanks for all the period I was in Plymouth. She's talking about some specimens. I like to think that she met one or more of these remarkable female scientists who worked there, worked at Plymouth at the same time, such as Marie Victoire Labour, a stalwart at MBA from 1915 to 1946, and an expert on mollusks and their parasites. Marjorie Allison Wilson, a specialist in seaweeds, who worked for many years along her husband in Plymouth, despite her work remaining unrecognised. Elsie Wilkins Sexton, who also studied crustaceans and was particularly talented in scientific illustration. And Molly Spooner, expert in oil spills and their effects, and also the possible effects of dispersal treatments. Another person who was there is someone who's going to feature in the next Voices for the Future project, Dame Miriam Rothschild, who was a leading authority on fleas. She also was frequently at the Natural History Museum. I'd heard a lot about Miriam Rothschild when I first started at the museum. So I was both slightly apprehensive and in awe when one day in the mid 1990s, she called my office phone to ask my advice on wood lice that had infested her local church. I think it might have been my first big inquiry, which I logged in our then inquiry service book in the days before the internet and emails. Miriam later sent me a letter to say thank you. And for some time after, we had the odd conversation correspondence about wood lice. It's amazing to look back on it all now. Isabella's appointment as a keeper of crustacea at the Natural History Museum had a wide ranging remit there are estimated to be over 50,000 species of crustacea divided into several major groups. And until 1937, when a colleague was appointed to oversee some of these groups, Isabella had responsibility for them all. They include the following, crabs, prawns, shrimp, lobsters, copepods, krill, sea spiders, also barnacles, and as Miranda mentioned, wood lice. The size of these creatures also varies enormously. For example, sea spiders, Pycnogonida, can be tiny with a leg span of about one millimeter or gigantic with a leg span of over 70 centimeters. Isabella would have arrived at the museum to find many previously collected specimens of lots of species in the storage areas, often unidentified and unlabeled. Part of her work would have involved distinguishing between these existing specimens where scientific investigation using a microscope and other instruments, but no computer of course, would have had to be meticulous and precise. Throughout my career, like Isabella, my fieldwork on board ship has been few, as most, of, as most has been terrestrial or semi-coastal collecting trips. Like her, the bulk of my work has been stationed in my museum lab using my microscope to identify crustacea, some new to science. Through in-house marine consultancies, I've often worked as an individual for many hours looking at oceanographic samples hour by hour through the microscope. Eventually the results of my work are pulled together as a collaboration with others into environmental impact assessment reports to better understand the deep ocean ecosystems ranging anywhere from the Falkland Islands to Africa. I and many other scientists still refer to some of Isabella's type specimens. That's new species 
with the tops of the specimen jars painted in red, an indication of the types. Those are the name bearing specimens. Still in use today, sometimes you use similar tools she used to dissect as well as some, as well as one of her micrometers, um, eyepiece graticules, which is a glass one centimeter squared, which is a piece of glass one centimeter squared with grid lines that she used to pop into the eyepiece of her microscope to aid the measurements and drawing of her specimens. The legacy of her work still lives on. Isabella would also have had to deal with newly collected specimens. Several scientific voyages and expeditions took place during her career, though it seems she herself was never on any of them. These voyages did have scientists and laboratories on board, but would often bring back samples for further investigation by museum specialists. Examples of these include the discovery expedition uh, investigations on the discovery ship, now a visitor attraction based in Dundee, that was undertaken between 1925 to 1951. Another expedition was the Great Barrier Reef Expedition, 1928 to 1929, about both of which Isabella was called upon to write papers on certain species of crustacean. Isabella was also a prolific author of her own research scientific articles over the course of her career. She wrote over 100 of them, plus reviews and obituaries. Pronunciation of the titles of many of these tests the ability of the non-specialist. For example, Gorgonidae, soft corals, Palinuridae, spiny lobsters, Rhynchocinites, shrimp, Echinocardium, heart urchin. A fellow scientist teased her, seeing her titles, saying that one title sounded like the first line of a limerick. How about the title of another of her articles? A cave dwelling mycid, mycid's a type of shrimp, from Cuba, cave dwelling mycid from Cuba. A cave dwelling mycid from Cuba. Was mm. often found playing the tuba. Ah. Ah, that opossum shrimp was no musical wimp. Well, kept her safe from a stray barracuda. Uh, <laughs> alternating with puffs on a hookah. Ah. Hmm. Stopping predators from trying to consume her. Ah. No. <laughs> Um, Isabella often included sketches in her articles to illustrate the points she was making. She was extremely particular about detail in the published versions of her papers. Proofs returned to her would be covered in corrections and comments. In her eyes, they had to be as precise as possible. Although most of her articles were in scientific journals, she did appear in more popular publications too. An article on the Chinese mitten crab, described as such because of its furry claws, appeared in the Illustrated London News in 1947. She was still publishing papers and reviews about 20 years after her retirement. A life steeped in science, a shoreline of study, a bright shawl of papers in an ocean of species. A record of change, a record for the future, a record in time, the time of destruction. Nineteen twenty five Gorgonids from Curacao Island. 
God gone, it's from Curious How Island. Wave gently upon the seabed and not a plant but soft corn. Where's an enemy's a panel? God gone, it's from Curious How Island. A life steeped in silence, a shoreline of study, a bright shore of papers in an ocean of species, a record of change, a record for the future, a record in time, the time of destruction. The development of the calcareous test of Echinocardium cordatum. Echinocardium cordatum. The sea potato. Sexual organs fading, 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 dissolving in acid pollution. Echinocardium cordatum. The Mitten Crab, a Chinese immigrant to Europe. These immigrants are, well, they are taking over the waters, afraid to return to Shanghai, where the stuffy wee mittens are an eating tradition. Now here they On the puerilous stage of some spiny lobsters, Palinuridae. Acidification in the ocean. Isabella's meticulous curatorial work, research and documentation 
on the Decapod collections have provided baseline data that has been used to compare with other data sets acquired several decades later. Her work serves as a foundation to aid some of the most recent oceanographic research projects. Observations of a past time when seas were cleaner and species diverse. Through her extensive and varied publication list of that time, it still provides a historical point of reference for many of the next steps of environmental monitoring and evaluation of the effects of climate change. Collaboration with scientists from abroad was an important part of Isabella's job, so she attended many conferences and meetings, making professional contacts. Within a short time, Isabella Gordon became known and respected as an international specialist in carcinology, the study of crustaceans. Fellow scientists wrote to her to ask advice on a specimen, and it seems she always conscientiously replied as fully as she was able. She had some knowledge of German and Italian, so could read foreign papers too. From the inception in 1960 of the journal Crustaceana, she was on their editorial board and was passionate about maintaining high standards in the journal. It remained of great interest to her all her life. Highlight of Isabella's working life came 60 years ago in April 1961. In the course of her international collaborations and correspondence, she'd come to the notice of fellow carcinologists in Japan. Emperor Hirohito was head of state at that time, himself a keen marine biologist. It seems that a 60th birthday in Japan is a special one, so extra celebrations were planned for around that date of the Emperor's birthday, 29th of April 1961. Isabella was sent a special invitation to visit Japan to attend these 60th birthday celebrations. Coincidentally, Isabella's own 60th birthday was in May 1961, very soon after Hirohito's. Such an invitation was extremely unusual, even more so because Isabella was a woman. And here she is with a group of scientists in Japan for that visit. Western visitors at that time rarely travelled to the country. Allied occupation of Japan had ended just nine years earlier, 1952. In Britain too, many people were hostile to Japan and the Japanese. Memories of wartime prisoner of wars and atrocities were still raw. You could say that Isabella's connections with Hirohito began in 1958, when she gave a talk to the BBC, which described his occupation as a marine biologist. On the screen you'll see the itinerary for her trip in 1961. It was very full. She had something, a full day each of the days she was there. Her trip was paid for by a Japanese newspaper, Yomiuri Shimbun and she was offered hospitality by several Japanese zoologists. Here you see her walking in the grounds near the palace in Tokyo with some of these zoologists. She organized that a number of specimens of crustacea from the Natural History Museum would be sent over at the same time to be included with a display from the Emperor's own collections. Throughout her visit, she was treated as an honoured guest, spending over two hours in an informal meeting with the Emperor, where it seems they engaged in discussion on their common interests. Her trip aroused great curiosity. News reports every day talked of the activities of the Lady Kaniebi Doctor, 
who had come to visit their emperor. Her trip aroused great curiosity in that part of Japan. When she gave a lecture in the Yomiuri Hall, she had a huge and very appreciative audience. She was taken to visit other museums and collections and inaugurated as the only non-Japanese honorary founder member of a newly formed Carcinological Society of Japan. A trip in a boat at Sagami Bay collecting specimens was an additional enjoyable experience for her. I had a wonderful time in Japan. Nowhere in the world could have I had a warmer or more spontaneous welcome or better hospitality. Even yet, it sometimes feels like a fairy tale or a pleasant dream, too good to be true. And this in spite of all my wonderful souvenirs and innumerable photographs, which prove that it actually did take place. For me, it has been a unique and unforgettable experience. Domo arigato, dozanaisu. Oh, oh, I've left out a tea. Un unforgettable. Oh, goodness sake. Over the coming years, it seems she kept in touch with the Japanese friends and fellow scientists she'd met. In October 1971, ten years later, Emperor Hirohito himself made a state visit to London. He had the expected state banquet at Buckingham Palace with the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society but also spent a day making visits to museums and scientific institutions. Isabella Gordon was one of the members of the reception committee of that day. Isabella Gordon became known as the Grand Old Lady of Carcinology and is a female scientist who deserves to be celebrated. Let's do that today. Isabella, 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 grand, 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 grand old lady of cosmology. Thermophilus shrimp of Tunisia sent her this limerick. Thermophilus shrimp from Tunisia said when it gets cold I get busier busier I dig a hole and fill it with coal and there's no one as warm as it is here now I thought that was rather good but it appears Dr. Isabella Gordon was not quite convinced, probably something to do with her Scottish accent. She replied to me, A plaisir, a plaisir, a plaisir, a well, the idea is okay, but a plaisir, a plaisir, a plaisir, is the rhyme a 
I should choose for Tunisia. A Tunisia, a Tunisia, a purist and Scot. I simply could not pronounce it to rhyme. Pronounce it to rhyme. Pronounce it to rhyme with it. Tunisia. And Catherine Booth and, and uh, Miranda Lowe are the two people who know most about her in the world, as well as knowing um, so much, uh, Miranda, about the crustacea that she studies, as well as the work that you do. So I'm going to hand back to Jack at the Marine Biology um, Association, because this is not my field. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That was, that was amazing. Um, so, uh, We've got a little bit of time now for questions. So if anybody who's watching would like to ask any questions, then you can put your hand up and I'll be able to um, enable your microphone. Um, or you can use the Q&A function. Um, while you're, uh, you're thinking about your questions, um, I've got a couple myself. So um, Miranda, um, your you talked about the the graticule. I don't, I'm not sure why, but that connected with me. I really like the idea of the fact that you've got an object that kind of connects you um, to Isabella. Um, I was just wondering if there are any other um, sort of pieces of equipment that you still use now that Isabella would have used in her time, or whether things have kind of changed so much that you're using completely different methods. And... Um... Well, uh, we still have um, well, some very old microscopes um, that she would have used as well. And they're still, you know, we get them annually serviced and they're, they're, they're still quite great to use. Um, but I do have um, a more up-to-date microscope, um, a more modern one that has a, you know, a camera um, adapting tube that you can attach a camera to it to take images because we, we're digital nowadays. But um, when I ordered that microscope, I still wanted a camera lucida. So what that is, for those that may be listening in that don't know what that is, it's a drawing tube that it kind of inverts the image that you're looking at, enables you to kind of like trace around the outline of something that you're looking at under, under the microscope. Um, I have um, my own kind of adapted micro tools because some of the um, crustaceans, they're not all as big as crabs and lobsters, although we can get tiny crabs as, you know, the size of a pea. But um, things like amphipods, the shrimpy like things, can be, you know, a millimetre. Um, or if you're looking at uh, copepods, even less than that. Um, but um, so I um, have adapted micro tools with a bit of tungsten wire that is sharpened in, in an acid to sharpen it to a point. And um, it's sort of, it's, so then you, you um, embed that. Well, when I first arrived, actually, I did inherit some micro tools, but I don't know if they, I don't think they were Isabella's, but um, they, they were probably somebody from, well, from the, you know, the late 1980s, 1990s. Um, but there was a small tin of micro tools that had the tungsten wire kind of embedded into um, plastic cocktail sticks, which we don't use anymore because of the whole plastic situation in the oceans. Um, but it's quite interesting what you inherit. And um, so my tungsten wire is embedded into a metal holder. And, and I use that like as if you're using a knife and fork um, to dissect, but, you know, very, very fine and very carefully. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. I, I like to think that there might still be a few uh, a few little pieces of equipment knocking around that might have 
Um, yeah. We've got a question um, from Diana in the Q&A. So Q &A is, uh, Q &A, uh, Diana's asked, um, is she properly appreciated today? So I don't know if that's for you, Miranda, or if that's um, Catherine, but um, or maybe both of you. I think for both of us, but um, uh, probably not as much as before now. So um, Catherine and I and, and Francis have been on this project for a number of years now. Um, and I would say more publicly under under recognized um, internally, you know, it's one of those things you will know about this person and um, when you're doing your everyday job. But, but then if you um, take a, a moment to reflect of the time that she was working in, as we've explained throughout this event, it's actually very remarkable, especially her as a woman coming into that that male dominated environment and, uh, you know, uh, publishing so extensively as well, um, not just on crustaceans you heard, but a number of other animals, you know, echinoderms as well. Um, it's, it's just an amazing feat, and I'm sure Catherine's got more to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I I can say she never was made a fellow of the Royal Society, although someone did come after her, another woman did become a fellow. The Royal Society didn't start admitting women until 1945. So Isabella was possibly a little bit too early for that. But that was a shame. However, she did get an OBE in 1963 for her services to science. She was also very much appreciated by other uh, marine biologists who were writing. She was extremely helpful and supportive uh, to people who were writing articles. She would send them, let them use her sketches. She would read over their manuscripts. She was in the background there doing a lot of work and a lot of support that maybe they they definitely appreciated, but the wider public didn't maybe get to, to know about. Um, so it's, it's good to be able to uh, celebrate her today. I have to say her own town in Scotland don't necessarily recognise her. They've got some standing stones with names on plates of famous people that came from that area, and she is not on them. We would love to get her on, um, but she's not there. We're trying. We still keep trying, but um, she's not one of them. Oh, that, I definitely think that's something that yeah, maybe maybe we can work to um, after as part of this maybe um I mean, can i just say as well miranda when when um junji came from japan to to look at the collections that he was he he knew a lot about isabella it's like people who who work in this field in japan are very you know seem to really kind of uh, value her still yes um, so what Francis is talking about, um, we had um, a, re a researcher um, from Japan called Junji, um, who uh, I think it was sort of late 2019, is it Francis? Yeah. Um, that, that came to visit and, and look at and examine um, some of Isabella's uh, specimens. And, you know, and, and we got a greater insight into Isabella, didn't we, from the it's Japanese amazing. perspective. It was, it was amazing, um, you know, uh, Japanese documents about her visit to uh, Japan and um, we had some translations um, a, a lot of remarkable things and you know how she is still remembered in Japan amongst that community as Francis said um, as being you know one of the only females when the uh, Carcinological Society of Japan um, first started um, so she's uh, very very important in Japan and um, what I was trying to everything's before um, uh, the pandemic but what I was trying to do after John G's visit is to trace uh, via him, um, the samples that were sent and um, that are possibly in the, in a lab um, within the oh Francis I've forgotten now it's the royal in, palace in the, uh, in the imperial palace yeah in the Imper yeah, imperial yeah. palace right. to see if they're and still there she, yeah. she still she still appears if you look at the English version of the Carcinological Society of Japan her name is mentioned quite prominently in the history of the society um, which is which is very nice yeah. So, so we're doing our bit. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I, I, was she was she kind of celebrated and respected at the time in the UK? It was it, it, was it was this very very different going to Japan and no, receiving no, these I, I really don't think so. The the fact she didn't become a fellow, she she had lots of eminent people trying to to put her name forward, and uh, 
The fact Hirohito himself came over in 1971 and there he was right away made a fellow of the Royal Society for his services to science, not because he was head of state of Japan. Um, and yet she had been doing all this work, <laughs> writing all these papers, and there was no none of that honour for her, um, which is sad, but it's not an unusual story amongst signed female scientists of the time, sadly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've, there's a question from uh, Michael in the audience. So Michael said, thank you for this brilliant webinar. Um, this presentation is very timely in terms of the societal struggles that women in professional fields experience in terms of gaining recognition. What was the inspiration for choosing the life and career of Isabella Gordon? <laughs> well, I, I came across her name. Um, I've been researching Scottish female scientists. I, I've had to stick to Scottish ones because there's so many. Um, I, I would get swamped if I included um, lots of English ones. And I, I look at all, all disciplines as well. Uh, and I came across her name. And uh, the more I found out about her, I thought, well, why, why don't we know about this woman? Um, and just then tried to, to plow on and dig to find all the references I could. But of course, Miranda knew about her already. So it was <laughs> lovely did. that we, we got together. Thanks to Francis, we got together. Well, I mean, the, 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 the inspiration for choosing Isabella Gordon came from both of these remarkable women themselves, Catherine and Miranda, because of course, Catherine, I, I, you know, I, I uh, learned about so many Scottish scientists from her. And then I bumped into Miranda first, quite a few years ago, at the Royal Society, no less. Oh, no. At a it was at a diversity at event. A diversity event, yes. And, uh, and, uh, and, and through chatting and everything, we got to realise that there was this big connection with Isabella, who'd, who'd worked in her. And it just seemed like a, a marriage made in heaven, because I knew Catherine and Miranda would be brilliant together. So. <laughs> Well, Miranda very kindly showed me some of the specimens in the Natural History. Oh, I was so excited that day to see her specimens in the Natural History Museum and see some of her papers in the archives there. That uh, notebook with her hand-drawn paint, it was just exquisite. I was just blown away by all that. And I would just love to, I live in Edinburgh, so I'm a long way from the Natural History Museum to visit a bit more often and look at all these things. I happen to know as well, Catherine, we've got some of her correspondences in the National Marine Biological Library here. Oh, well, right. So, you'll have to come um, with you as yeah, well. you have to come and have a, have a look at those as well. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'll join you, Catherine. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, like I think Warren's well. coming as well. <laughs> Warren's coming, yeah. We'll get all the choir tagging along. Yes, I know they'll want to come. Um, I just, what, what do you think um, Isabella would have made of this celebration of her life? I, I sort of read about her and found out about her as a person. Do you, what do you think she would have? How do you think she would have felt about it? Uh, she was she was quite modest but she mm. also was she was assertive enough um she has a relative in australia that we'd love to have um joined us today we did tell him about it about this event i don't think i think the timing is is not good um considering where he lives in australia um so anyway yeah i don't know <laughs> i hope she would have been pleased <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. It's nice to think that hopefully, um, yeah, she would have would have appreciated the, the um, this. I think. Um, if I had a question as well, so um, ah, oh, you yeah. like this one? Yeah, You've just seen it, so, um, Christopher Griffiths. Yes. Hello. Um, Christopher. Thank you for this wonderful tribute to Isabella. I'm her cousin in Australia, and I'm so. Oh, yes. oh fantastic! So much. Oh my yeah. gosh. Welcome, Christopher. Hello, you are. I don't see you on the screen, but that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, you're very welcome to turn your microphone on and say hello, actually, if you want I to. I and, and video, maybe, so that we can see them. That would be... Oh, we can't good. see them because we're in webinar, Catherine. Oh, oh we're in webinar. Sorry, yeah. can't do that. But then. we could hear them if you wanted to see them. You would like to share your microphone, Christopher. There's no pressure at all, then. Feel free to... If you put your hand up, I'll, I'll, I can enable your microphone. But... Yeah. Absolutely no pressure. I don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, That's wonderful. Okay, so actually, Christopher, yeah, he's, I'll just allow you to talk if you'd like to say, say hello. Hello. Hello, Christopher. 
You're muted. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> good, good morning. So, oh, you're morning. Yes. Yeah, some, yes. some social hour, Christopher, is it? It is. Yes. It's nearly 3 a.m. So. Oh, wow. But I, I, yes. No, I'm really pleased I made the effort and got up and um, I really enjoyed the musical pieces. And to hear some of the limericks, um, uh, I, I had the very good fortune of meeting Isabella in 1982 when my wife and I made a trip to England. And um, she, was, she was known in my family through my grandmother, who was her cousin. Um, and they were contemporaries, my grandmother and Isabel. And um, we knew about her. We knew about that she was a scientist. But uh, I don't think her her full contribution was understood by her relatives here. And uh, as Catherine was saying too, it's also been very disappointing to hear about the fact that her um, name has been left off the Standing Stones in Keith because I was, I've was i been in touch with the, the um, heritage group in Keith and I've received a copy of the book, which is the companion to the Standing Stones, which does contain information on, on Isabel. But it's very disappointing to know that she's not in amongst the group who have been honoured with the stones. So perhaps something can be done about, about that, I think. And particularly, I marvel at her achievement, given her background, and um, also that uh, her there was a professor at the Aberdeen University who also recognised her, her, her exceptional ability in research and um, diverted her from teaching into that field. So um, that was really something. But... Um, it's, it's a, a marvellous achievement that um, from that background that she was able to, um, you know, contribute as much as she did. And I know my grandmother was very, when I, when I qualified as a teacher back in the 70s, she was very, very um, moved by that because, you know, I was perhaps the second person in, that she knew who had actually had an, a university education. So um, my grandmother came from a very similar background, of course, in Scotland. So, um, you know, the importance of education was seen as, um, a, an, you know, a big stepping stone for, uh, for people like Isabella and for my grandmother. And, um, and I think she appreciated that in her grandchildren out here in Australia. Wonderful. Oh, Chris, I'm so excited you joined us. Well, yeah. That's just lovely. Thank you. Ah, thank you. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice. Okay. I hope. Oh, oh. Sorry, I've just accidentally muted. Uh, oh, you accidentally muted. <laughs> sorry, Christopher. I thought you're too excited then. Yeah, I thought you <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, Try again. Try again. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Sorry oh, good. about that. <laughs> That's all right. When, um, when we can travel again <laughs> and we could leave Australia, uh, I'm hoping to, to come to, um, to England and to go to the Natural History Museum, I'm hoping I might be able to see some of Isabel's notebooks because um, I did see some photos from them um, and I think some research was being done on, on Isabel's um, work and I asked for permission to include the photos in an article I wrote for the Queensland Family History Society's journal. So I was hoping I might be able to perhaps sneak into the archive with someone and have a look at um, yeah. something like that because I we when we when I visited her in 1982 she had her uh, sort of collected volumes of of work on crustaceans and they were massive pieces of massive books with these brilliant illustrations in and she was very proud to show them to us when we were when my wife and I were visiting. Wonderful, yeah. I'm not sure we'll be able to sneak in now. You've just uh, announced your intention. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> fine. You'll be welcome, yes. Chris. You're I, I, very I welcome. Would, would. You'll be joining yes. us to go to Plymouth, Christopher. I think yes. that's the one going to Plymouth. Right, yes. Jack? You're ready for very a welcome. Very, very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I'd um, like to do that. I'd love to do that. I'm sure that, mm. I'm sure that um, you'll be able to link up and have, have a have a conversation like this i think there's there's so much to explore there um yes so thank you so much for joining us it's really, really thank fun. you very much thank you i'm just very excited christopher you really oh thanks catherine for uh, thank you for keeping me in touch with yeah, what's been going on that's great because i thought the the time of day would just be impossible for you well, <laughs> well you know 
I'm, I'm very impressed, uh, just for that you that you managed it because our choir member from Australia didn't get up at three a.m. this morning. Ooh, <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Not sure I would either, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Christopher, uh, Francis will be asking if you sing and would like to join the virtual. Sorry, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've, I've, I've just realised we've got one more hand up in the audience. It's, it's, it's Gerald. I, don't, I know we're supposed to be finishing now, <laughs> but um, Chris, for that, that, thank you so much for joining us. It, um, I'll leave, I'll leave you to maybe have continued conversations um, with with Miranda and Catherine and Francis after. Um, after the session, um, Gerald, if you if you had a very 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 quick question, sorry, we're okay. I'll uh, I'll turn turn your microphone on. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud yeah. and clear. I came to the MBA in 1958, and Mary Park was always talking about Isabella Gordon then. Oh goodness! Oh. Mary Park, I... Of course, I, Mary, Mary Park was in phytoplankton. But, I mean, she was another one of these fighting for a long time and never yeah. got a, a Royal Society Fellowship. Yeah. Was she Mary Winifred Park? Is that right? Is that That's her? right, yes. I, I came across her name too, actually, yes. Yeah, so she's a bench I think I missed her out on the list. Yeah. Thank she, you. Was my, she, she was my mentor. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah. I wor worked under her for many years. Uh huh. She you was an expert on phytoplankton. Phytoplankton. Did you ever meet Isabella? Did Not to know? my knowledge. I may have done. I met a lot of people in the early years. Yeah. But um, I was very much a junior and I didn't remember them all. No, fair enough. Yeah. So, 1958, I came to the MBA. 58. Wonderful. And until COVID struck, I was still there. Yeah, yeah. People stay a long time in the, these jobs, I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> we miss you, Gerald. Yeah, well, right, thank you. That's you. my telephone going there. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Gerald. Yeah, go and get it. Maybe that's, that's somebody <laughs> saying we've gone over. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so thank you very much for uh, for that. Um, hello. Hello, how are you? All right. Oh, hello. Hello. The of the <laughs> Let's meet Gerald. <laughs> Um, no, thank you very much for that. Thanks for thanks for sharing your insights. Thank Christopher and, and Gerald and everyone else who's asked a question. Um, okay, and thank you um, everybody for all of your contributions, Miranda, Catherine, Francis, and all of the, the choir. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, just a, a few things quickly. So um, first of all. Uh, I'd like to say if, if if you've missed any of this recording, so if you've tuned in late um, and missed the start, then you can catch up by watching our YouTube feed um, and that'll be up there um, where you can start from the beginning and uh, join in a conversation in the chat. Um, and if you subscribe, subscribe there, you'll be able to find out about all of the future events that we're running. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to a short questionnaire that we're going to be um, posting um, at the end. So when you log out of this session, you'll be able to access the questionnaire. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to close by thanking the whole team. Um, Herbie hasn't had a mention yet. He's sat behind the scenes. So yeah. um, <laughs> I'd like to say thanks to Herbie and everybody else um, who's, who's, um, who's helped out today and been part of this amazing performance. Um, and. Uh, yeah, for those of you at, at home, they, uh, they've put in so much effort and all of the rehearsals and everything, it's been incredible to, to be part of. So thank you, Jen, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, and thanks to everyone who shared questions and insights as well. So it's been, been a really, really, really lovely event. And thanks very much to you, Jack. Yes, for, thanks, Jack. For having us here and, uh, and, and to everyone for coming along. And I hope some of you will come to our next event as well on the 7th of December, when we'll be singing music by lots of women composers. It'll be slightly Christmassy. If you want to join in, just join our virtual choir and, uh, and you can join in too. Um, we've been really pleased to share our story of uh, Dr. Isabella Gordon with you and, and, and hope that she signs, shines a light for future generations in these difficult times. So join us 
in the March of the Women of the Science. Tunisia, 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 Tunis